Welcome to the second module in the New Institute series, Discovering Servant Leadership. In the signature lecture, we provided a biblical framework for a Christian life of leadership. We learned that uh, we're not to be kings, we're to lead with a servant's heart. And then in the first module, we discussed faith, love, and service as the foundation for a Christian life of leadership. We know that Jesus called us to serve. We also know that there are many ways to serve. One way to serve, just one way, is to serve by leading. If we're going to serve by leading, we want to find a model or an approach that's consistent with Scripture and our faith and our, our love for others. So in this module, we'll be looking at ideas about leadership. We'll try to get a clear sense of what it means to be a servant when we lead. So what is leadership? Boy, there are a lot of definitions. When I look out at the world and think about leadership, I see two models or approaches or paradigms uh, in the world. And the first one I call the power model of leadership. It says that leadership's about acquiring and wielding power. It's about making people do things. It's about how to attack and win. It's about manipulation and coercion. It's about the leader issuing orders to the followers. I see another model. It's called the service model. It's not about acquiring and wielding power. It's about making a difference in the lives of others. Uh, it's about identifying and meeting people's needs. And it's not about the leader that focuses on the people being served. These are very different models. Uh, there are a number of ways to compare or contrast them. One is that the power-oriented leader wants to make people do things. The service-oriented leader wants to help people do things. That's why the servant leader is often a facilitator, a coordinator, a healer, a partner, a coalition builder, just helping the right things to happen. Another way to compare or contrast is this. People in the power model see you know, a hierarchy, a pyramid uh, in the organization. They see only the people at the top of the pyramid have power, so only they can be leaders. But in the service model, the hierarchy really doesn't matter. And that's because anybody can be of service. Anybody anywhere in an organization can identify and meet the needs of others. Anybody can be a servant leader. I believe there doesn't have to be so much pain and suffering in the world. I believe there doesn't have to be so much violence. I believe that there don't have to be so many crushed dreams and untapped talents. I believe there don't have to be so many unsolved problems and opportunities ignored. The world does not have to be like this. It really doesn't. But one reason the world is like this is so many people are using the power model of leadership. It's the dominant model in most cultures, and it's got some very severe problems. For example, in the power model, uh, the first goal is just to have power, not to use it wisely. There's no moral content. There's no real purpose. It's just to have power. Secondly, the power model promotes conflict between power groups. And you can see why that happens. If you think leadership is about acquiring and wielding power, then you're going to build your power base, and she's going to build hers, and he's going to build his. And pretty soon you have all these rival power groups. And what are they doing? They're fighting each other for power. And that doesn't leave a lot of time or energy for them to solve problems or seize opportunities. So organizations and communities get stuck. They just can't move forward. Third, the power model defines success in terms of who gains more power instead of who does the most good for their family, their group, their organization, or their community. Those are severe shortcomings. The power model is also not good for the leader. What happens is in the power model, the leader thinks it's about him. And he stops listening to other people, stops paying attention to other people, and gradually becomes disconnected from the people he's supposed to be serving. Uh, that can lead, I think it should lead, to a loss of the leadership position. Even worse, I've met people in the power model, and I've watched them, and it's just always the case that they can never, ever get enough power. They can't get enough. It's, it's an addiction, it's a disease, they want more and more, and they're never happy. It leads to a kind of spiritual corruption and even a life of self-torment. One of the stories in, in the literature that's a good example of the corrupting uh, of, of a leadership through the desire for power would be Shakespeare's Macbeth, which is uh, set in medieval Scotland. Uh, Macbeth is a Scottish general, uh, loyal and courageous, and as the play begins, we see him uh, defeating an invading army. Um, after that, he comes across a group of witches, and they prophesy that he's going to become the Thane of Cawdor, which is the Earl of Cawdor, and that he will eventually become king, and that another general, Banquo, his descendants will be kings as well. So 
soon he gets word that King Duncan has, in fact, made him the Thane of Cawdor. Uh, the, the prophecy is beginning to be fulfilled, and so he just sort of loses all moral restraint. Uh, he just becomes suddenly very ambitious and very hungry for power. Uh, with the encouragement of his wife, he kills King Duncan. Uh, then he blames it on two Chamberlain, and, and then he kills them. Um, then he goes off and he hires someone to kill Banquo. And then he uh, has somebody murder Macduff's uh, spouse and children. Uh, he just becomes this, this terrible tyrant, this murderous tyrant. Um, the son of King Duncan organizes an army in England, joins with other Scottish nobles, um, attacks um, in Scotland. Macbeth uh, is defeated. Uh, he's actually killed in combat with uh, Macduff. It's just a, a really um, sorrowful story of a man who began as a loyal and courageous man, uh, who became overcome with this desire for power, and ended up being a murderer. And he was just paranoid. I mean, he, he wasn't happy. He knew that he'd seized power, so somebody could take power from him. Um, and so he just kept killing. So it was a, a real tragedy and, and a real strong example of the corrupting influence of power. There's a more recent version of the story. Uh, Robert Penn Warren wrote a novel called All the King's Men. And it's about Willie Stark. And Willie Stark's a country lawyer. And he cares about people. And he starts out by fighting the corrupt political machine. And he eventually wins. And he becomes governor. And he starts doing good things for the people. But then his desire for power kind of swallows up his desire to serve. And pretty soon, he is leading his own corrupt machine. That's a really a sad, brooding story about someone who set out to serve others and ended by wanting others to serve him. Sometimes people think they're in the service model, but they're really in the power model. And the story that comes to mind here is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. The book was by Ken Kesey, and of course uh, the movie is quite famous. So we come across Nurse Ratched, uh, who believes that she is uh, doing what's in the best interests of the patients of the mental institution where she works. Well, Randall McMurphy uh, is a criminal, petty criminal, but he's a criminal. And he figures out that he doesn't want to go work on the prison farm because that's hard labor. So if he can get himself transferred to the mental institution and said, that's going to be an easy life. So he shows up in the mental institution, and he's full of life. He's full of energy. And he, he wants to help all of the patients to, you know, to reinvigorate their lives and to be healthier and happier and do more things. Well, of course, Nurse Ratched is not amused. Uh, she sees McMurphy as a threat. Yes, she believes she's, she's helping people, but she's also domineering. She's manipulative. She's very focused on her own authority. Um, she actually diminishes her patients. Um, she goes to war with McMurphy. She manages in the end to get him sent off for a lobotomy, brain surgery that just changes his mental ability, changes him as a person. And um, McMurphy's friend, the chief, just can't bear to see him that way. And so he smothers him with a pillow, and the chief makes a break um, to leave the mental institution. But, you know, it's just, it's just painful and, and sad to see the nurse win and McMurphy die. And the nurse thought that she was serving, but she was really using the power model instead. For power model leaders, power is self-justifying. That's, that's what they want. Um, they're not good at identifying and meeting the needs of others because that's not what they're trying to do. That's not what they care about. That's not their goal. Um, if they can gain power by being remarkably indifferent to the needs of others, they'll do it. I've met power-oriented leaders who are willing to make life worse for other people so long as they get power. They may exploit the needs of others. They may ignore the needs of others. They're usually not focused on meeting the needs of others. And so this just allows difficult things to continue. It allows the perpetuation of, of fear or violence or war or environmental degradation or starvation or disease or all these problems in the world they're not trying to address. So the power model uh, does not advance the kingdom of God. It simply does not advance the kingdom of God. And I think that's the biggest problem with it. And we are not going to help the kingdom of God to break into our world by fighting power with power. I mean, that just leads to more battles, more pain, more suffering. We're going to bring the kingdom into this world through love and service, not power. 
Now, I know people say, well, come on, you've got to fight fire with fire. You know, power exists, the power model, it's all there. Well, maybe sometimes you fight fire with fire. But there's an alternative. In the long run, it's a much better alternative, and that's to fight fire with water. We need to extinguish the drive for power and replace it with a commitment to service. It comes as no surprise that Jesus rejected the power model. He chose service. Malfer says that you can sum up the life of Jesus with one word, service. Oswald Sanders said, well, you know, Jesus just defined leadership as service. Uh, Donald Craybill said that Jesus didn't come issuing orders and directives. He came asking, how can I serve? This issue of power versus service or servanthood was made very clear uh, by Jesus himself in all three of the synoptic gospels. And the, the setting in Matthew is that the mother of James and John comes to Jesus and says, uh, would you put my sons at your right and left when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus declines. Uh, when the other disciples hear about it, they are truly miffed. Now, I'm not claiming that miffed is a real translation of the words in the Bible, but they were, they were, uh, they were miffed. They were not happy. So Jesus gathers them all together and he says this, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever would become great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This passage is found in the Gospel of Mark. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew. In slightly different language, it's found in the Gospel of Luke, all three of the synoptic Gospels. It's clear that we are not to lord it over each other, and we are to lead with a servant's heart. Malfers looks at the, the Greek underlining the words of ser servant and, and slave, and he says that Jesus weaves together the two words in a way that it really means we willingly obligate ourselves to serve. That's important because servanthood is not servitude. Servitude occurs when we are forced to serve. We're not forced to serve. We choose of our own free will to serve. We choose of our own free will to follow Christ. We choose of our own free will to be servant leaders. Jesus made it clear that the kingdom of God is not about domination and oppression. The kingdom of God is very different from the world that we live in today. Over and over again, his teachings about the kingdom turn our world upside down. So instead of dominance and control, we see a love and service. Um, Irwin pointed out that you know, leading, when you follow Jesus, it's not about a command. It's not about coercion. Um, it's about serving. It's about listening. It's about working with people in a way that they recognize your leadership and they willingly follow you. So there's no need to lord it over people they willingly join because of the way you are leading. In his book, How God Became King, N.T. Wright said this idea of servanthood is at the center of Christ's vision of the kingdom of God. So his central message was about the kingdom of God and servanthood is at the center of that message. So it's the core message inside the central message. It's really important. Jesus was clear about his rejection of the power model, but we're surrounded by a culture that promotes the power model. It just assumes the power model is the model. And it's very hard to resist that because we're surrounded by it every day. It's hard for many church leaders to, to resist that. Um, Tony Barron in his book, The Cross and the Towel, observed that there are many church leaders who like the power of the sword and the shield that comes from the secular world instead of the cross and the towel that comes from, from Christ. Reinhardt said that there is an epidemic of power leadership uh, in our churches, that we have sort of become immune to it because it's so common, uh, that we feel like we've become more sophisticated, and so we've, we're adopting these modern ideas of, of management, as though we're saying to ourselves, yes, um, Jesus said those words, but that was a couple thousand years ago. Maybe we should just use, leave those on the dusty roads of Galilee where he said them a long time ago. And yet Paul warned us against accepting hollow and deceptive ideas that are based upon human tradition instead of Christ. Henry Nowen, in his book, In the Name of Jesus, uh, talked about the temptation of power because he said it's easier to exert power over people than it is to love them. 
Uh, that's, that's a shocking statement, and, and I believe it's true. That there are people who, who think it's easier to try to control someone uh, than to love someone, and yet we are commanded to love. But wait, let's be realistic. We live in a real world. Power abhors a vacuum. Someone's going to exercise power, right? It makes a difference who that somebody is. Can a servant leader exercise power? Sure. A servant leader can exercise power, but it's not what the servant leader seeks. It's just a tool. It's just something to be used when you need it and then put, put down when you no longer need it. When servant leaders exercise power, they try to exercise it with people, not over people, and they exercise it on behalf of others, to serve and protect others, not to benefit themselves. We have some really good historical examples of people who did exactly that. I'm thinking here of Cincinnati. I'm thinking of George Washington. I'm thinking of Jose de San Martin. Cincinnati uh, was a, a Roman, Roman consul. He lived in the fifth century BC. Uh, he's semi-legendary, I think you could say. Um, he was a farmer. And um, the Roman Senate came to him one day and asked him to be the absolute dictator in order to organize the army and defeat an invading um, group of enemies, more than one tribe. I don't know what it was like. I wasn't around in 5th century BC. I don't know if there's any record about how they actually asked him. But uh, he was a farmer. And it is recorded that his biggest concern was that he needed to plant his crops. Um, so I'm just imagining these chariots coming out to his farm. Uh, and you know the Roman Senate leaders dressed really nicely and getting out of their chariots and walking into the field to find Cincinnati um, and saying, um, hi, uh, Cincinnati. Uh, would you mind awfully, uh, could, would you be the absolute dictator and uh, take care of this problem for us? I don't know. I don't know what happened. But I can imagine Cincinnati saying, uh, what? What? I've got to plant my crops. I mean, if I don't get my crops planted, um, my family could starve. We're not going to have anything to eat. What are you talking about? Obviously, you guys are not farmers. And then they would say, oh, but please, pretty please, we really want you to be the absolute dictator. And finally, I guess he said, Oh, all right, you know, rolled his eyes and said, OK, but it better not take very long, because i got to get back here and plant these crops. Well, according to the story, he organized the Roman army, defeated the enemies in 16 days, just 16 days, resigned his absolute dictatorship, went back to his farm, and hopefully in enough time that he actually got to finish planting his crops. So Cincinnati is one of these semi-legendary characters that exemplifying this Roman ideal of, of citizenship and his ability to, to give up power rather than craving it. Well, George Washington has often been called a modern Cincinnati. Uh, he, too, was a farmer and a surveyor, a person of uh, good character, a person who wanted to, to serve the public. And it's pretty amazing what he did. He was the commander in chief of the Continental Army. Uh, he was the president of the Constitutional Convention. He was the first president of the United States. There are historians that think that um, if Washington wanted to be king, he could have been king. He was that popular. There was that much support. And we would have ended up being a constitutional monarchy. But Washington didn't want to be king. They were fighting against the king. He didn't want to be one. He just wanted to be a, a public servant. So he resigned as commander in chief after the war. Uh, and he stepped down as president after just two terms, ensuring a peaceful transition of power to the next president. Joseph Ellis, the historian, says that people trusted Washington with power because he was so willing to give it up. Again, power was a tool. And when he didn't need it, he put it down again. Jose de San Martin, born in Argentina, 18, 1778. He went to Spain, uh, got a military education, served in the Spanish army. And then in 1812, he returned to Argentina, and he joined the rebels fighting against Spanish rule. Uh, they accomplished the independence of Argentina in 1816. But he knew that Argentina might not be able to remain independent as long as the Spanish controlled Chile and Peru. So he organized an army uh, with Bernardo Higgins and marched 5,000 men across the snowy Andes Mountains to Chile and managed to defeat the Spanish in uh, Chile. Um, he declined to be president. Could have been president. So he gave that to O'Higgins instead. He went back to Argentina and he organized um, a, a fleet to sail further north to Peru. 
And uh, he got there in 1821 and fought the Spanish and won that battle. He was named the governor of Peru. And then he met with um, Simon Bolivar, who was up further north fighting. And they had this famous meeting, with only the two of them present. And when the meeting was over, um, San Martin decided that he would give his power to Bolivar. And he went back to Argentina and eventually retired in Europe. For many Argentinians, he is one of their greatest national heroes because he fought for others, not just himself, and he gave power to others rather than trying to keep it for himself. Three examples of people who had a lot of power, saw that it was only a tool, and were willing to give it up. We've talked a little bit about the power model, uh, the problems with the power model, how Jesus rejected the power model, how it's still tempting uh, to use the power model. Let's talk about the other model the service model, which is the way of Jesus. So since it's not about acquiring and wielding power, servant leaders don't go around asking, how do I get power? How do I make people do things? They ask, what do people need? How do I help them to get it? What does my organization need to do? How can I help my organization to do it? So rather than embarking on this quest for power, the servant leader embarks upon a quest to identify and meet the needs of others. Servant leaders um, have a lot of different tasks. I mean, they, they propose the agenda, they, they ask questions, they, they mentor, they coach, they pitch in and do real work of themselves. It's a very meaningful and satisfying way to live and work. It's also a way to make love real at work. I have seen love made real at work. Let me give you one example, perhaps a surprising example because it's about TD Industries, which is a specialty construction company located in Dallas, Texas. TD Industries, I, I've had the privilege of knowing uh, their uh, CEO for many years, Jack Lowe. Tall, lanky guy, Texan, gentleman, great sense of humor. Their company adopted servant leadership 40 years ago. Um, they had people read about servant leadership, talk about it. And it became part of their culture. So for them, you have to be able to do your job and you have to be a servant leader or you can't work there. And to them, being a servant leader means helping other people grow. So Jack, because he's humble and has a sense of humor, says, we've been working on servant leadership for 40 years and we have yet to produce one perfect servant leader. What they have produced is a very caring company that's very productive and successful. They have uh, about 2,300 employees. They do $600 million worth of business uh, every year. They have been on the fortune list of the best companies to work for in America since the list was started. Uh, fortune finally put them in their Hall of Fame. They've just been in every year. They are employee owned, uh, so they all, all have a stake in what happens. Um, they really pay attention to each other. They really care about each other. I, I went down and spent a few days uh, interviewing members of the company, and I found that, yeah, they know who they report to, but they're very, very uh, conscious of their um, work with their, their peers, their, their team members, and they don't want to let them down. Um, they really do care a lot about each other. Well, I, I remember that um, a local TV reporter went to interview um, some of these TV industries um, partners. They're called partners rather than employees. And he went to a work site. So, you know, everybody's running around with the hard hats and the heavy boots and the and he found one of the employees, one of the partners, and started asking him about servant leadership. And he said, you know, servant leadership, people say it's about caring and paying attention to each other and so on. And he said, um, but do you think maybe it's really about love? And the guy looked at him and said, love? No. Um, I mean, and he kind of frowned. And then he suddenly said, yeah, I, I guess you could say it's about love. Because it was. That's the kind of organization that they have built. Servant leadership's not about lording it over each other. It's about loving each other. N.T. Wright said that our big story as Christians is not a power story. It's a love story. It's the story of God's love for us, transmitted through Jesus and the Holy Spirit to us that we can use as we lead and live. So one of the interesting things then is how do you express that love in an organization in daily life? Well. Howard Snyder said, you know, it's not about a chain of command. It's about a network of love. And you can have a network of love if you really respect each other. So here's a really important question. Would we lord it over others if we really respected them? And the answer is no. Because when we respect people, we listen to them, 
We consult with them. We include them. We invite them in. We team up with them. We work with them. We don't lord it over them. This network idea is that each of us has gifts, and they're different. And so each of us can contribute our gifts at different times uh, to the organizational work. And so maybe one of us steps forward to contribute the gift we have, and others encourage us. And when we've done that, we step back, and someone else will step forward with their gifts. And people contribute. Everybody has a role. Everybody has a place. But it's not a hierarchy. It's a network. It's a network of love. Oh, but what about authority? Hmm. Well, authority is the legal right to act, the legal right to, to make a decision. And maybe sometimes a servant leader would need to use legal authority um, to make a decision. But here's my experience. If you're, if you're at the point where you have to use the legal right to act to resolve a situation, you're already in trouble. It's already broken. Uh, it's time for you to go back and reconnect with the mission, reconnect with the people you work with, reconnect with all those relationships and find out how you can move forward together, how you can rebuild the network. Servant leaders rarely act upon the legal right. Servant leaders rarely use authority in that sense. Servant leaders use what we call moral authority. And moral authority is something you can earn. If people respect you and trust you, if people know that you have their best interests at heart, if people know that you have faith and that you're trying to advance the kingdom and you want to be on that journey with them, you can earn moral authority. And if you have moral authority, you don't need the legal right to act. It's not, it's not even going to come up. Moral authority will be enough. I think it's important to note that leadership experts uh, have been coming to some conclusions that support the teachings of Jesus. I'd like to mention uh, Robert Greenleaf. Uh, Robert Greenleaf, um, for many, many years, uh, worked for AT&T. Um, he worked for AT&T from uh, the, the 1920s to the 1960s, and he rose through the ranks, and he became the director of management research at a time when AT&T was one of the biggest companies in the world. He had more than a million employees. So his job was to figure out how do you help the leaders and managers of the world's biggest company um, to be as effective as possible. And what he concluded after 38 years working there was the most effective leaders were the ones who were focused on serving others. So in 1970, he published an essay uh, called The Servant as Leader and coined the phrase servant leader and servant leadership. I mean, the idea we know has been around for 2,000 years, but he actually coined those words. And he said that it starts with the desire to serve. Servant leadership starts with a desire to serve, to serve first. And then when you see the opportunity to serve by leading, then you aspire to a leadership position. He pointed out that that's very different from someone who starts with a desire to lead because they want power or they want wealth. So you begin to see the same idea here as what Jesus said, the difference between the way that Gentiles lead and the way service, uh, Jesus wants us to lead. So he followed that up pretty closely. He said that the servant leader helps people grow. Matter of fact, the best test is do those served grow as persons? Do they become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And he cared about the least uh, privileged in society. Are we helping to make their life better or at least not making it worse? You have James Autry. James Autry was a fighter pilot, a poet, and the executive of a big publishing company. And he's written some wonderful things about servant leadership. In one of his books, he said, you know, leadership is not about being boss. It's not about trying to control people. It's about showing up and building an environment in which people can be their best. It's building a community, building a place where you can be authentic, building a place where people can bring their spirits to work and do their best work. He says, it's, a lot of it's about paying attention. And finally, he said, leadership requires love. This is, this is the conclusion of somebody tested in the marketplace in a competitive industry after many, many years of experience. It requires love. Meg Wheatley is a leadership consultant. She wrote a book called Leadership in the New Science in which she said, you know, we've got to stop looking at the world in terms of Newtonian physics as though everything's a machine. And we've got to start looking more in terms of quantum physics uh, about relationships and connections. 
She says, that's really what works uh, in organizations. And she said, people who um, build bad relationships, um, people who are basically toxic in their relationships, um, that's real negative energy. That's, that really doesn't work. But people who respect others and the fullness of the contribution they can make create these positive relationships, uh, that really works. And she said, the most powerful thing we have in the workplace is love. And they're talking about being effective and getting the work done. And it's completely consistent with the teachings of Jesus. So I think some of these experts have come to the conclusion that, yeah, we can achieve things together by loving each other instead of lording it over each other. In summary, I see two models of leadership in the world, the power model and the service model. Um, the power model has a lot of problems with it. Jesus rejected the power model. For one thing, it does not advance the kingdom. The service model is about identifying and meeting the needs of others. It's about figuring out what people need and getting it to them. It's really fun to see that uh, some leadership experts have done research that supports the teachings of Jesus and have come to the same conclusion that we can achieve things together by loving each other instead of trying to lord it over each other. Are there uh, any questions? Uh, Dr. Keith, is there room for ambition in servant leadership? Thank you for the question. Yes, um, there is room for ambition in servant leadership, but it's not focused on oneself. So there's ambition for, for one's organization. There's ambition in terms of, of reaching the goals that you've set out you know, for, the, for the group to achieve. Um, one of the most interesting uh, works on this uh, was done by Jim Collins. Um, and he talked about how the most successful leaders that he called level five leaders were very ambitious, but they're ambitious for their organizations and very humble about themselves. So I think that's perfectly appropriate. I think servant leaders think about what are they going to leave behind? I mean, they tie their ambition to what's their legacy going to be, whether it's when they, they leave the organization or pass on or just pass the torch. So yes, it is appropriate, but it's not about oneself. It's about how you can serve others better and how you can leave behind some kind of a gift. Um, how about another question? Dr. Keith, do you happen to see examples of servant leadership in Hawaii? Oh, um, thank you. You know, I really think there are servant leaders everywhere, uh, in our families and in our groups and so on. I think they, they're not really doing a lot of self-promotion. They're probably not, you know, on the front cover of a magazine or you know, featured in a newspaper story. They're just quietly doing the loving and serving and, and you know, the work that we do in our families and our organizations. Um, Years ago, uh, I had the privilege of working for a man I consider to be a servant leader, and that was Governor George R. Yoshi. Um, and I got to spend a few hundred hours with him in enough situations where I kept hearing that he wanted to do what was good for people, and he wasn't talking about political aspects or whose idea it was or who gets the points for it or whether, but what's the right thing to do, not only for today, but for future generations. So I, w I just felt very fortunate to be working for him. The problem is I think you have to be around somebody long enough to know and you can't do it based on a few eight second sound bites on the TV screen. You just have to be able to work with somebody day after day, month after month to get an idea. Why are they making the decisions? What are they doing, what they're doing? But I think there are servant leaders everywhere and when you start paying attention and getting to know them, you discover them. So thank you for that question. How about another question? So Dr. Kent, my question would be if we are currently using a power model, how do we switch into a servant leadership model? It can be very challenging to change from a power model to a servant uh, model. Um, but you start by, by paying attention to others. Ask yourself, you know, what do people need? How do I help them to get it? 
rather than asking, you know, what is my position, how, how do I get more power, he's saying, what do they need? And, and it takes time to identify the needs of people, so that's a real task. And then, you know, once you figure out what they need, can you provide it? Well, assuming it's moral and legal, that you want to provide it. And maybe you're not the right person to provide it, but you can find someone else who can provide it. So it's just, you just start by focusing on others. And, and I believe that you can do that consistently, even in a big organization that's, that's focused on power. Um, but if you, if you do the things that servant leaders do, you can be successful and you can create your own sort of authentic relationships within a, a large organization. Um, so focus on others. What do they need? How do I help them to get it?